Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos walking through the entire open free textbook, a foundation course in reading German. But in this fifth video in the series, we will not, as you expected, be covering the fifth unit within the textbook for at this point, the book itself asks us to pause and do a little bit of review and practice to see how well we have learned the grammatical information presented thus far. This is something which the book does every four units. So after the eighth unit, we'll have a similar review and practice session. And also after the 12th, and then of course the 16th is the end of the textbook. So this is the first of four I think this is a very valuable opportunity for you to test, especially your reading knowledge. Con consider the fact that this is a textbook over um, your ability to read something in German and then presumably even within your own head translate it into a form that you understand in English. This is exactly the skill rather than say um, the kind of conversational touristy skills you might learn in a high school course. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to do exactly that. So um, I'll go ahead and read each one of these sentences for you in German. I'd recommend you to pause the video after each sentence is read in order to copy it by hand into a notebook, uh, leave a blank space under it for you to provide your own English translation, and then after we read um, all 20 of these sentences in German, we'll go through all of the proposed translations of them one by one in the remainder of this video. So the first sentence is, Wenn haben Sie gern? Meine Verwandten habe ich gern, aber auch viele andere Menschen. The second sentence, das Auto hatten die Nachbarn, aber gestern noch nicht. Nein, das haben sie erst seit heute. So we have a little vocabulary here. Erst seit heute is just since today. The third sentence, du hast zehn Franken. Ich habe 20 Franken. Zusammen haben wir also 40 Franken. Nein, ihr habt um, 30 Franken. Du bist dumm. So, die Franken in this case refers to Swiss francs, basically money. The fourth sentence, Wen haben wir da? Das ist dein Freund. Er war schon lange nicht mehr hier. Schon lange is for a long time. The fifth sentence, Die Sterne, die Sonne, der Mond und die Planeten sind Himmelskörper. Die Erde hat einen Mond und andere Planeten haben viele Monde. The sixth sentence, Die Frequenz des Tones beträgt um, 440 Hertz. The seventh sentence, die Seiten eines Quadrats bilden vier rechte Winkel. The eighth sentence, der Inhalt des Buches zeigt den Fachleuten eine Lösung des Problems. The ninth sentence, die Nutzung der Sonnenenergie verschafft der Umwelt eine Entlastung von Kohlenmonoxid und Dioxid. So, a little vocabulary here is the Entlastung, is relief from, say, a load or a stress, or in another context, exoneration. The tenth sentence, die Leute fuhren auf der Autobahn, verbrachten etwas Zeit in der Stadt, kauften einige Sachen, tranken ein Glas, Mineralwasser und kamen endlich nach sechs Stunden wieder nach Hause. The eleventh sense, jeder Mensch in dem Zimmer wusste solche Tatsachen, aber manche da gaben es nicht zu. The twelfth sense, euer Haus kostete sicher viel zu viel. Dies sagte unser Onkel Wolfgang, als er das Zimmer verließ. The thirteenth sense, ihre Nachbarn bewohnten ihre Wohnung drei Jahre lang und dann verloren sie alles in der großen Flut. The fourteenth sentence, der Freundin der Schwester leiht der Student die Vorlesungsnotizen. Hoffentlich gibt sie dem Studenten 
die Vorlesungsnotizen vor der Prüfung wieder. The 15 Cent, eine Steigerung der Lohne, steckt die Kaufkraft der Konsumenten und gibt der Wirtschaft einen Impuls. Die Beschleunigung der Inflation ist nur eine Neben ähm, äh, Nebenerscheinung. So here the Kaufkraft is the buying power. Makes sense because Kaufen is buying and Kraft is power. So this is a compound word as we have seen many times thus far. The 16th sense. Eine Senkung der Zinsrate bremst den Zufluss des Auslandskapitals. Dadurch fällt der Weckkurs der Inlandswachen. Aber ein niedriger Wechselkurs bringt der Exportwirtschaft zu Wachs. Uh, the 17th is die Bundesrepublik Deutschland ist ein Bund von 16 Ländern. Sie hat ein Parlament, aber auch die Länder haben eigene Parlamente. Jenes heißt Bundestag, diese heißen Landtage. Hm, jenes und diese. I feel we have seen that somewhere before. Keep that in mind as you are translating. The 18 sentence. Der Vertrag legt die Verpflichtungen und Rechte aller Vertragspartner fest. Er führt außerdem die Bedingungen einer vorzeitigen Kündigung an. The 19th sense. Die Biografie des Autors zeigt dem Leser nur einen Teil der Komplexität literarische Werke. The 20th sense. Die Romantiker verstanden das Leben als ein fortwährendes Dichten. Dies setzten sie der nüchternen Prosa ihrer Zeit entgegen. So, die Romantiker is um, contributors to the romantic period of German cultural history such as the late 18th to early 19th century. We can also translate this as the Romantics. That was kind of the era of um, Kant and Hegel, right? Uh, a big th a part of um, Hegel's aesthetics or his lectures on fine art is how the Romantic era is kind of the third and final phase you have within this development from symbolic to classical and then finally Romantic art. So keep that in mind as you are translating this. I'll go ahead now, pause for a moment, uh, do these translations, and then we'll meet back in just a little bit. All right, now we will go ahead and compare our own translations with the suggested translations provided by the textbook itself. We will be going through these fairly quickly because there are 20 sentences after all. And um, the thing that I really want to emphasize is that in doing these translations in a course on reading knowledge rather than, say, conversational skills, as would usually be the case, the thing you should be looking for is how each one of these sentences exhibits a particular grammatical principle, which we learned maybe in the abstract in the first four units, but now we get to see how it functions or how it works within actual quote-unquote discourse, how it works within actual texts that you might be reading in the future. So, a great example of this you find at the very beginning of the first sentence. Then haben sie gern. Now, your first temptation, translating this as a non-native um, speaker of German, might be to um, move from left to right one word at a time, translating it into the kind of word order that you might have in English, in which, in English, um, the subject of the sentence would typically come first, simply because so much of meaning within the English language is determined by word order rather than morphology. Well. In German, we have morphology to tell us the role of the sentence, so that first word might look like who as the subject of the sentence, but it's actually whom, which is the archaic English way of saying that it's the object, or maybe we might say the accusative, and we know in German also that that's the object because it's then, and that n indicates an objective rather than subjective function. We also know that then cannot be the subject because haben 
um, is not the form that um, the third person singular would have. So the question is um, asking um, whom do you like, and it's asking the formal you. That's why it's the haben rather than asking the form of, of do, etc. So the answer is uh, meine Verwandten habe ich gern. Oh, here's another example of how um, you might think as a native English speaker that the subject always has to come first. You might think um, ich habe gern blah blah blah. Well, um, we can have this uh, word order change within German because once again so much of uh, the information is communicated by morphology etc. And this is another great example of that. Now we will move on to the second sentence. Das Auto hatten die Nachbarn aber gestern noch nicht. Nein, das haben sie erst seit heute. So, here's another great example. As, as an English speaker, you might think that the subject always comes at the beginning of the sentence, and therefore the subject of this sentence is das Auto. And you might justify that by saying, well, das um, is uh, something that doesn't look to me to be any different than the nominative. After all, the neuter singular nominative is das Auto. Well, we have to keep in mind that in the nominative, you have four different for forms of the, depending on case, um, but in the neuter you have two different cases share that same morphological form of das. It's both the nominative and the accusative, and if you look at the next um, unit within the sentence, hatten, you know that that cannot be the conjugated verb for the singular neuter word das auto, because hatten is with the en at the ending um, in the plural, and that would make sense because the unit following after it, die Nachbarn, is also in the plural. We have that nominative article, die, indicating that it's in the plural, and now it makes sense that um, we're talking about the neighbors having the car rather than uh, the car having the neighbors. But we know that uh, this is something which actually is not the case because the following word is but. Okay, which indicates a certain hesitation, um, and then gestern noch nicht. Uh, they did not ha yet have that car. Yesterday is the time. Okay, um, and the second person in this dialogue um, agrees, basically, he says, nein. That's right, they did not have the car. <laughs> this is the confusion about um, agreeing with negativities. Um, uh, nein, das haben sie erst seit heute. So, um, once again, das, okay, is kind of referring to the car, okay, um, and that is in the object position once again rather than the subject even though it's coming first. And we know that because haben sie um, is plural um, and um, is referring to die Nachbarn and they're the ones who had the car and the time once again follows afterwards. In the first sentence, gestern tells us when and this one tells us when they got erst seit heute. So we'll move on to the third sentence. Du hast zehn Franken, ich habe 20 Franken. Zusammen haben wir also 40 Franken. Nein, ihr habt nur 30 Franken, du bist dumm. So this is a pretty simple sentence in which somebody has failed to do basic mathematics because 10 francs plus 20 francs um, together, zusammen, um, um, is not um, 40. Okay, 10 plus 20 is 30, so we have a little disagreement here. And this is also kind of showing you the different forms depending on personal pronoun. Du hast, ich habe. Zusammen haben wir. Nein, ich habt. Somebody else is telling them in the plural. Um, <laughs> ich habt. You guys have um, 30 francs, right? The fourth sentence. Wen haben wir da? Das ist dein Freund. Er war schon lange nicht mehr hier. So, um, then, we already know that that is whom rather than who, okay? And we know that um, this is the object rather than the subject once again because haben is in the plural, specifically in this case the first person plural, haben wir. So, what do we have? there, or rather, what do we have here, as we would translate colloquially into English, although da is in German the word for there, that's why Dasein is the being that is there. Okay, well, das ist ein Freund. So, what's das? Well, this is basically the English word of saying, what do we have here? Oh, this is, uh, you know, you say that about somebody, oh, this is Chad, right? Das ist, that's basically the same function here. 
Um, and um, this is somebody who uh, was not here for a long time. Er war schon lange nicht mehr hier. We haven't seen him for a while, that's why um, we have to ask, well, who do we have here? It's something that is out of the ordinary, that's why we notice it. Fifth sense, die Sterne, die Sonne, der Mond und die Planeten sind Himmelskörper. Die Erde hat einen Mond und andere Planeten haben viele Monde. So, a few things to look for here. Obviously, cognates from um, German to English with a very similar form can be identified right at the start. You have um, stars, die Sterne. Sun, die Sonne, and Moon, uh, de Monde, and also planets, uh, die Planeten. But what are all of them? All of them are Himmelskörper. Now, what is Himmel? Himmel is basically, in this context, um, heavenly, right, or heaven. Um, and then uh, Körper is basically body. We know the um, Latin word corpus. Okay, maybe there's some relation there. So heavenly bodies are, <laughs> um, in this context anyway, the um, things that you can see in the sky when you look up, um, but are extremely far away, like stars are extremely far away. That's why they're heavenly bodies. Now, um, the, um, the difference between the um, moon of the Earth and those of other planets, we find out here, is a difference in number. The Erde hat einen Mond, but andere Planeten haben viele Monde. Now, what's the difference? If you look very closely at the morphological form of Moon, because the Earth only has one of them, it's Mond. Okay, but but it, another planet with many moons, like say Jupiter, um, we have that e at the end. Monda, okay. So that is a pluralization, which is one of many ways that that can be done in German as opposed to in English. It's usually done just by adding an S. This is a, a type of pluralization that simply adds an E to the end, which must be learned along with all the others, but we will go ahead and move on now. Um, die Frequenz des Tones beträgt 440 Hertz. So this is pretty simple. The um, frequency of the tone, and we know that this is genitive because we have des tones, okay? And this is something which um, we translate in English as is, but in German it's beträgt, and it just gives us the number. So we'll move on now to the next sentence, die Seiten eines Quadrats bilden vier rechte Winkel, okay? The sides, Seiten is a cognate with sides, um, the sides of what? Okay, we have multiple, we know that because it's d Seiten, the sides of a square. And we know this is a genitive because we have eines quadrats. And what do they do? They form, or the word here is a built in. We keep in mind that built is kind of a word in German related to things like, say, um, the uh, picture. Okay, or um, building is culture. So they, they form together this nice little composite of um, four right angles, and right here is rechte, kind of a um, cognate with the English word. Now we move on to the eighth sense. Der Inhalt des Buches zeigt den Fachleuten eine Lösung des Problems. So, Inhalt is an example of um, something derived from a word with a prefix, a verb with a prefix. Remember, we had that unit where we learned that um, the kind of holding you get if you add in is containing, okay? Whereas the kind of holding you get if you add a different prefix might be a different meaning. So this is the kind of holding within the book of content which is contained. And we refer to that as a noun and in the um, nominative, de inhalt which leads us to refer to the book in the genitive, which with uh, des Buches. And what it does is it shows, or zeigt, and it shows um, a certain kind of people. We know that because of Leuten is people. So what kind of people? Well, they're specialists. Fachleuten. This is kind of a compound noun that we're used to. And what it shows them is eine losing des Problems. Once again, des Problems is in the genitive, and losing is solution. So the ninth sentence, Die Nutzung der Sonnenenergie, another compound word. What kind of energy? Energy of the sun. Well, we call that solar energy in um, English. 
um, what it does is it lessens Verschaft. Um, it lessens eine Entlastung is how you would translate that. It lessens the burden on the environment is how the translation does it. But in German, that's not the word order. Instead, we have uh, environment coming first. Der Umwelt. Now, why can we do that? We can do that because the meaning of it being on the environment, that's who basically is receiving the lessening of the burden of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, um, because it's the recipient, it's in um, the dative case, right? And we can see that also because although der Umwelt uh, might look like the nominative masculine singular, we know that der also has other meanings, and one of these is the last two rows of the feminine column. If you look up in the dictionary, Umwelt is uh, feminine. It's die Umwelt in the nominative. So we know that this is the dative recipient of that reduction in stress. We move on to the 10th sentence. Die Leute fuhren auf der Autobahn, verbraten etwas Zeit in der Stadt, kauften einige Sachen, tranken ein Glas Mineralwasser und kamen endlich nach sechs Stunden wieder nach Hause. So we have people, well, we saw that word just a little bit ago, die Leute, okay, and what did they do? They um, went on, they drove on the highway, okay, uh, Autobahn is another sort of compound word, we translate that into um, the highway, something to do with cars, you might have noticed, um, and um, they uh, spent some time in the city, etwas, some, Zeit, Stadt, we know these words, and they also uh, bought um, some stuff, uh, we know that it's in the past tense, because it's kauften, keep in mind that simple past tense, that t morpheme uh, we also use in English walked but um, as opposed to buy okay so we uh, we have the past tense kauften but we also have an irregular past tense tonkin okay this is like drink drink we have a kind of internal shift of vowel uh, trinken tonkin rather than adding that t morpheme at the end and what they drink they uh, drink a glass of mineral water, another compound word, Mineralwasser, okay? And then um, finally, or as it says in German, endly, okay? We have finally in English, but uh, here we have the, the morphemes, leash tells us how, and end tells us um, that it was at the end, endlich, um, they came um, uh, after, okay? Um, six hours nach ses, uh, sechs Stunden, Wieder nach Hause. Now, wait a minute. We have that same word nach uh, appearing here, but in a different um, context. If in the first one, it tells us after how many hours, nach sechs Stunden, uh, but here it's telling us more like where they're going. Um, uh, they come nach Hause. There's that um, great Zilbermann song with the same title. Okay, so keep in mind the context of the word rather than translate it just look through looking at the form of the word in isolation in the 11th sentence jeder mensch in dem zimmer wusste solche tatsachen aber manche da gaben es nicht zu so we have um one of those words that functions kind of like the but is not the we learned about these these are dare words we have uh, words like this dog is tall that dog is tall Every dog is tall, right? Now, this is such an example of that every word, jeder, okay? We're talking about jeder Mensch in this context. It's more like every person, okay? Um, and every person specifically in dem sima. Now, um, dem is dative, and we'll learn in much greater detail in the following lessons about how different prepositions require different cases. And in, in this particular case, requires a dative form, dem sima. Every person in the room um, knew, wusta. We know that that's the irregular past tense of, um, of wissen. Okay? We have the present tense um, of uh, uh, wissen being like ich weiße. Okay? Uh, but wusta is that irregular, which also has that t morpheme at the end. Okay, they know such facts, um, but many there did not admit it. Now, if you translate that from English one word at a time, you might think that it's um, they they gave, right? 
Um, but it's actually not. We know that it's an idiomatic uh, form of a word we might think we know because we have that um, preposition su at the very end. Or is it a preposition? Is that actually a detachable or a separable prefix which gives us a whole different word? We had the example in English of we know what giving is, but forgiving is something rather different. Here, um, uh, aber manche da gaben es nicht zu is they did not admit it rather than which is I guess a certain kind of giving if you admit you're giving in I guess is how you might roughly translate that into English the next sentence euer Haus kostete sicher viel zu viel die sagte unser Onkel Wolfgang als er das Zimmer verließ so um, surely <laughs> your house cost much too much is how the book translates this for us and this is what was said by our uncle wolfgang as he left the room pretty straightforward really the 13th sentence ihre nachbarn besuchten ihre wohnung drei jahre lang und dann verloren sie alles in der großen flut so um we're talking about neighbors who um had two different words closely related to one another which exhibit a principle we learned earlier so we have um wohnung which is the apartment where they lived but the word we have for living here is bewohnten and we learn that that prefix b um turns a um a an, a verb that does not require an object into a verb that does require an object in this particular case um we're not saying that so much that they lived as they inhabited and what they inhabited was their apartment. See this relation between bewohnten and wohnung. And they did that for three years until they lost all in the Great Flood. Now look at the form of alles. This is a word which maybe looks naively to be the genitive. We have that genitive S we've encountered thus far. Well, this is not genitive. This is rather... I think an example of uh, something that uh, follows the expectations of uh, words that look like das. Okay, we have those words that um, in the uh, nominative and accusative have that s more like das than like the genitive. Keep in mind that distinction. And of course, uh, flute is a um, cognate with flood, and we know that it's the great flood or the huge flood because it's großen. Keep in mind in French, groch. Um, means basically very large, right? Now we have the 14th sentence. Der Freundin der Schwester leid der Student die Vorlesungsnotizen. Okay, and hopefully they give the students those notes before, for is before, uh, before the test. They give it to us again. So um, here we have der Freundin, okay, der Schwester. Now we have two different der. Okay, but we guess the sense that these are not the same function of der because even though they look um, on the surface to be the same word, they're actually not. We know that because Schwester is a feminine word because that's sister. So what exactly were the forms of der that go with the feminine column? Well, those were the genitive and the dative. Which one is these? We have um, a relation here in which somebody is receiving something else so what is being given directly is the notes for the lecture okay but the one who's receiving it is in the dative case that is the sister that's why we have der okay um and we have um the uh article d before the notes themselves because they're plural but they're also accusative so the first two columns of the plural are d and then you have um den and der following afterwards right so the 15th sentence Eine Steigerung der Löhne steckt die Kaufkraft der Konsumenten und gibt der Wirtschaft einen Impuls. Die Beschleunigung der Inflation ist nur ein Nebenerscheinung. So here we have a wage increase strengthens, okay, kind of a um, verb form of the adjective uh, stark we know in stark contrast it's strong contrast in english well here we have um a verb form of that steckt okay it strengthens um the um buying power we see that word kaufkraft a compound between we know kaufen is buying and kraft is power and it's the um the buying power of in the genitive 
plural because der is the plural form consumption of all consumers and it gives the economy overall a boost impulse um, increased inflation admittedly which follows after that <laughs> is only a secondary symptom they assure us although now is probably not the time to be talking about inflation uh, the 16th sentence eine Senkung der Zinsrate bremst den Zufluss des Auslandskapital. So here we have a few different words put together. We have capital, okay. Um, we have Land, which is country, and we have Aus, which is basically outside of in this context. So the country, the capital from countries outside of ours is kind of what we might roughly translate as going on here. And what we're talking about is the flow of it, because that's in the genitive. See the genitive S, Auslands Kapitals, and Des. So um, we're talking about the flow, because Fluss is related to uh, the word for like river, right? Um, and we're talking about the flow of foreign capital into our country as something which is uh, slowed down by a decrease in the interest rate. Okay, the um, uh, rest of the sentence deals with similar economic issues, which I will let you read on your own. We'll move on now to the 17th sentence. Die Bundesrepublik Deutschland ist ein Bund von 16 Ländern. Sie hat ein Parlament, aber auch die Länder haben eigene Parlamente. Jenes heißt Bundestag, dieser heißen Landtage. So, jenes und dieser, this is something we learned before. They do have maybe more straightforward meanings as um, words that function like the, but when used together in order to differentiate things that might otherwise be confused with one another, uh, because you're talking about multiple things at the same time to compare them, this means the former and the latter. The translation of this sentence is the Federal Republic of Germany is a federation of 16 states. In this context, Ländern is um, meaning states. Okay, um, It has a parliament of its own as a whole country, but each state has its own parliament. So now we're talking about the parliament of the uh, country and then the parliament of each state. That's why we have to differentiate them with the former being called Bundestag and the later being called Landtag. Now the 18th sentence, der Vertrag liegt die Verpflichtungen und Rechte aller Vertragspartner fest. Er führt außerdem die Be Dingungen einer vorzeitigen Kundigung an. So we have the suggested translation, the contract establishes the duties and the rights of all signatories. Oh, there's that word again, Rechte. We knew that it was right angle. Well, here it is coming again in the context of the rights in a legal sense. Okay, so actually quite similar to English. Um, along with this, the suggested translation tells us it indicates the conditions. Oh, wait, there's that word bedingen, um, a variation thereof anyway, which we know from Hegel is a word that gives us a play on words um, if we're talking about the bethinged. Universal is the property of a thing, but the unbedingt or unconditioned universal is a universal freed from the constraints of a thing to become the force of electricity etc so even here we have um, a deeply philosophical insight into the german language which will be useful in reading hegel so we have here the conditions for premature termination so why is it premature it's before time for is before sight is time so it's premature because it is before the time in more literal sense in German. So we'll move on now to the 19th sense. Die Biografie des Autors zeigt dem Leser noch einen Teil der Komplexität literarischer Werke. So um, we have the biography of authors, okay? Um, we have biographical information about the author is rather how we might uh, phrase that in English, uh, although it is in the genitive here, des Autors. And what this does is it, um, and it shows to the reader. And we know that it's a uh, indirect relation of showing it to them because we have the uh, dative M, dem laser, okay? And what it shows is only, nor um, a part. Uh, einen Teil is part, okay? And that is in the accusative because we have the end. So it's showing to the reader only a part of the complexity. We have 
der Komplexität, äh, Komplexität literarischer Werke, of the literary works. So now we move on to the final sentence we'll consider today. Die Romantiker verstanden das Leben als ein fortwährendes Dichten. Dies setzten sie der nüchternen Prosa ihrer Zeit entgegen. The Romantics understood, we have verstanden in the past tense, um, what they understood was life. Das Leben, um, which is uh, in the um, accusative neuter case, uh, das is both nominative and accusative singular neuter. They understood das Leben als ein fortwährendes Dichten. Uh, Dichten is basically um, a word similar to in um, English you would talk about a dictation having something to do with language. Well, here we have Dichten is as a type of poetic writing. Um, dies setzten sie der nüchternen Prosa ihrer Zeit entgegen. So, entgegen gives us a type of opposition. We move that word at the very end all the way to the front here in the translation. They opposed this to the sober prose of their time, which was lacking in the kind of poetic inspiration of the Romantic era. So that will conclude today's review and practice. We will move on in the next video to consider Unit 5 on prepositions and reflexives. Thank you for watching.